recording now. And Hello everyone, good to see you all jumping on there. Um, as per usual, we're just going to give it a, a minute or so to make sure that everyone's settled in and, and on board and um, can hear us okay and everything. So we're going to give it a minute before we formally start. So it's just before we, we start, um, Good to see familiar faces and a lot of new ones on tonight. Um, so that's great. Um, throughout the tasting tonight, what we're going to want to hear from you guys is as many questions and um, and and tasting notes as well. If we, once once we're tasting the whiskeys, let us know what you think and and we'll discuss around that. Um, those of you who've been on the the, the tasting before know um, exactly what it's all about. Just um, a few more people joining in there, so we'll give it one more minute or so. You're all looking very summery. A lot of polo shirts there tonight. Are you just off the golf course, eh? I see. So, oh, I'm saving the start now, but more people joining in the waiting room. Gregory says, was going to go shirtless, but it might have been in bad taste. I suppose it depends whether or not your camera was on or, or not, you know. <laughs> I could have spotlighted you at the start. <laughs> I'm going to, we're going to assume that everyone who's who's there with the camera off is, is in fact, shirtless, you know. <laughs> um... Right, so folks, there's, there's been a, a bit of quietness there in the waiting room, so there's no one been joining, so we'll, we'll, we'll start. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome. Uh, my name is Luke Claudia Holland. I'm the general manager in the, the Celtic Whiskey Baron Larder and Irish Whiskey Experience down in Clarny County, Kerry. We're the world's largest collection of Irish whiskey. Uh, we have 1,500 whiskeys in total, a fantastic bespoke cocktail menu, wonderful restaurant, and we're home to the Irish Whiskey Experience, where we do lots of kind of tasting experiences um, with, 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 with guests and locals alike. Uh, our visitors to the town and locals alike. So, so we we're also a little off license, although we're uh, our sister company, the Celtic Whiskey Shop in Dublin, is, is obviously the the main off license and the main attraction. Um, really excited to be to be doing one with, with Ryder Sears and Walsh Whiskey tonight. It's one of our most popular whiskeys in the bar since we opened in 2016. The Copper Pot has has been there, and, and the Irishman, but definitely the the Ryder Sears Copper Pot has been one of our our biggest kind of sellers, and it's a great solid go to whiskey in that price point around 45 euros, um, can't beat it. So we're looking forward to, to learning more about the brand and tasting the range here tonight. Uh, so before I, I pass you over to, to Lena Canning, who's joined us tonight, and absolutely delighted to be, to be joined by her. Um, I'm gonna say, as I mentioned at the very, very start, uh, please do get your questions in as we go through the night and get the tasting notes. Um, you're not here to listen to me, but I'm here to, to, to vocalize your questions and comments. So do get them into the chat room. We love to hear them. So Lena, do you want to tell us a bit about yourself before we get started? Yes, I will indeed. Thank you for having me. Hello to everyone and thank you for joining. Um, I represent Walsh Whiskey. Um, I joined the company within, I'd say, two years ago. Uh, so really delighted to jump on board with the guys there. Um, and I suppose, you know, we are an independent Irish-owned brand. Uh, founded in 1999 by Bernard and Rosemary Walsh. And um, Bernard had always a passion, huge passion for Irish whiskey. And I suppose when he lived in London uh, at the time, he still had a desire for uh, producing his own brand. So taking him back to Ireland where he did his research. And I suppose at that time, there was only three main distilleries in Ireland. And um, so Bernard went on his research to learn which, you know, major distilleries and um, to source all his information to produce his own brand. And I suppose Bernard took reference to the golden era of uh, Irish whiskey distilling from the 19th century. And that's where he got, got his inspiration for uh, producing Writer's Tears and indeed the Irishman. And I 
goes within the range or where Irishman is more focused on the single malt end and writer's tears focuses more on copper pot which is a uh, pot still focused so um yeah so that is both our ranges and uh we have tonight four amazing expressions uh, we have our copper pot which i suppose is a great introduction to writer's tears this is the first core range um within the range um, and then we have also double oak um, and our Marsala cask and our rare Mizanara wood or Japanese cask. So that's our four uh, lineup for tonight. So guys, I suppose, you know, whiskey tasting is very subjective. So what, what I get, you mightn't get. So it's really nice to hear your thoughts and I suppose pick your brains on the tasting notes and the nosing and, you know, so it's great. Everybody will get different, you know, tastes. So if you want to just maybe all start with the, the copper pot. Marvellous, we'll, we'll get the copper pot poured. This is, as I mentioned at the start, this is one of my favourite whiskies in this price point. I think it's, it's, it's probably the most dangerous whiskey we described, the most dangerous whiskey in the, in the bar because you wouldn't realise it was going down. <laughs> Do I definitely us? agree with you there, Lou. <laughs> Do you want to tell us about, before we get, we get into yeah. the, the nosing and the tasting, do you want to tell us what the composition of it is in terms of, of pot still mold breakdown and cascading? Yeah. Yeah, uh, so the copper pot is um, a unique style of 60% uh, pot still and 40% malt. And it's aged and matured in um, ex-bourbon barrels. It's 40% ABV, triple the stilled as well. So as I said, we focused more on pot still. So with pot still in mind, you do get that wonderful, um, robust flavours that wonderful, I suppose, um, more spiciness from your copper pot. Mm. And even on the nose, the nose is very, very, it's very mild on the nose. It has a lot again, of classic flavour. Throw it back at everybody else, you know. <laughs> well, I was going to say, it's got that, those really kind of classic, good quality flavours, like the vanilla, green apple, like those orchard fruits yeah. that really come through. Like it's, it's, it's a... It's real solid, a bit of butterscotch maybe on the, in there as well. Um, David Matthews, then, nosing that, he says, do you recommend adding water? What, what, what do you reckon? I mean, look at each their own. I personally don't add water. Um, it's, it's at 40%, you know, for me. So like, to be honest, I'm, I'm happy enough to drink this. But again, everyone is, you know, tastes are very different so there's no harm in dropping an ad you know a little added water just to infuse the molecules to release more flavors each their own you know that's what i say you know but uh Definitely. once you're drinking writer's tears that's the main thing whether it's with water or mm. anything else <laughs> like initially you get that wonderful pot still spices that wonderful peppercorn mm. um, actually at, at the mouth then five, five seconds in, you get that lovely vanilla at the back of the palate and that lovely, just, just that lovely finish. And you get that. Mm, sorry. Yep. Yeah, you I, get that lovely um, apple the wonderful citrus flavours coming through there. Mm. No, they, they really, really do. And, and Mary in the chat says caramel, a little apricot and peach. I think definitely for me, yeah. definitely on the palate, I got the, got apricot and peach way more than, than on the nose, but 100% there. Um, yeah. Gregory, who's probably still top, got the shirt on or, or off, I'm not sure. But um, he says it's smoother than Luther Van Dross. So there you go. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Maybe a, a prepared line. I don't know, but it's a good one. Um, yeah. Anya and Breen says almond and lemon um, on the nose. Mary says... Doesn't need water, this one. Yes, vanilla, a little spice, very nice. David Matthews says, when you when you use barley, uh, where do you source it from? I suppose we might come back to that one later on when we, we look more at, at where the whiskey is coming from. Um, but yeah. we'll, we'll bank it in, in, in mind. Um, Patrick absolutely. says, clove, clove and vanilla. So all fantastic taste yeah. notes. And absolutely spot on there. You do really get that clove's influence there. Um, and that wonderful vanilla just keeps coming through there. It is such a really, really easy to drink whiskey. It's a great introduction to the portfolio of um, Writer Tears. Um, and, you know, 
our audience for Writer Tears Copper Pot is, will be in the region of 25 to 45 year old females and males. So it, it's just a great introduction to the range. You know, it's just very easy. If somebody isn't too familiar with Irish whiskey, it is a wonderful introduction. Mm. Well, it, it's it's definitely one that when, when we're selling it at Celtic, we always say, like, if people are, like, not sure if they're like, oh, I want to get a whiskey, yeah. but I'm not sure what they like or or if they even are a fan of whiskey, I'm like, well, they won't be offended by this one, trust me. So exactly. it's a good one. Um, Bob, in exactly. the chat, Bob in the chat says, marzipan in the throat finish, um, definitely. Um, Dirt says, really nice. Um, Tanya says, butterscotch, honey, green apple, a little, a little bit of spice on the palate. Davy says, love yep. caramel once a drop of water is added. So it's we've got off to a great start anyway. Um, yeah. So you were saying... And, uh, yeah. Mm, sorry, go on. I think there might be a small bit of a lag. But <laughs> no, it's okay. And I suppose, you know, people will ask, you know, why is it called Writer's Tears? Well, you know, I suppose at that era style of back in the 19th century, you know, you had your inspiring writers at that time. You had your writers like Joyce Yates, just to name a few. And uh, it, is, it is said that, you know, as a good story would go, that they would take refuge to, to the public houses. And at that style, at that time in Ireland, um, this was known as the champagne blend of using, obviously, pot still and malt distilling in copper pots. It was known as champagne blend. And that's what notably they would drink at that time. And when you would get writer's block, they would obviously go on the drink. And... Uh, drink their whiskey and obviously they would get their inspiration back and they it said that they would have uh, cried tears of joy so it's happy tears so that's where where the name has uh, stemmed from no it's excellent it's it's definitely an evocative name as well and also obviously you know people refer to tears on the side of the glass you know when they when the oil yep. is down the side so it it has all those those um those gregory says that explains ulysses <laughs> so exactly yeah <laughs> Um, we got a question there saying, should you heat the glass with your hands before drinking or is that a no-no? Um, to be honest, I don't know whether there's a right or a wrong to it, to be mm. honest. Um, I suppose I would always let my whiskey breed for about maybe 10 minutes anyways before, you know, I would drink it anyways, like, you know, but um, I suppose each each their own, I say, you know. Mm. No, definitely. I suppose, you know, adjusting the temperature from room temperature, be it yeah. colder or making it warmer, is going to, to alter the flavour. And it's going to uh, dumb the flavour, dull the flavour of any, any, any drink you drink, be it a beer or a wine. It's, it, you tend to taste things that, that it masks things when it gets either very hot or very cold. So I suppose it depends on the quality yeah. of the whiskey as well. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so you were saying that, that the, the, that's where the, the name come from. So what, what, what made... Um, Bernard Walsh and go from uh, London in, in 1999 to, to, to um, bottling that, that first whiskey. Where does the, going back to the question asked about the barley, where does the whiskey come from and what's the story behind that? Yeah, um, I suppose, again, Bernard continuing to um, follow his passion for creating um, super premium Irish whiskey. And um, at that time, you know, as I said at the start, there was only three main distilleries in Ireland. And Bernard has a long term agreement with Irish distillers to uh, create the whiskey to his own specification. And also um, Bernard would um, use different casts to obviously bring writers tears into the, a modern twist um, through cast experimentation, through different um, source and different casts, whether it's uh, a cognac cask or a um, Mizanara wood. It's all about bringing old styles to, uh, into a modern twist you know mm -hmm. yeah definitely and what what year would he would, would that have that relationship with Arsenal have started when did he launch the first uh, 1999 hmm. and that, is that when the first writer's tears came out is it writer's tears come out in 2008 ah, very good. so it's it's, it's Irish, older the than irish man hmm. sorry the okay. irish man came out in 2006 and then the uh, writer's tears come out in 2008 so it's it's obviously it's it, it predates the kind of the modern resurgence of Irish whiskey, which I suppose a lot of people consider, I suppose, the opening of Dingle in, in 2012 um, as the kind of starting gun for that the, the modern age because you brands like Teeling and stuff follow. So obviously the, 
the writers here exactly. the Welsh's whiskey is, is has been around before um we've got a few absolutely more, yeah um questions in the comments there tanya and breen says i'd work with quite a few playwrights and it's a go-to gift they receive from anyone traveling through dublin airport many insta photos of them holding a bottle with a cry face so there you go and some of your, <laughs> um, your miniature packaging has some great there's one that we used to sell pre-pandemic that looks like a book and you open it up on the miniature. Yeah. And i presume you still do that one do you we we do actually but we've also uh, reinvented the mini pack to um normally you would have three same uh, copper pots in the little mini booklet but now we've introduced um a castrant and the double oak and the copper pot in the little mini booklet so it's given the option of three different expressions in that little booklet mm. um excellent um mary says leave it for 10 minutes um, I suppose this is to your point about leaving it breathing in the glass. Coming from Scotland, yep. wouldn't be there after two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a fair comment, I suppose. Um, fair point, Mary, fair point. <laughs> Avril says, uh, what's the age profile of copper pot? And I suppose also my question to add to, to uh, maybe you could answer with Avril's would be, there is a there is a makeup to the blend. You mentioned that the, the writer's tears is, is more pot still heavy. Is there a percentage or or how does that break yes, there is. the age profile as well? Yeah, uh, age profile is about six to seven years, and uh, our mash bill is 60 40, so 60 percent uh, mm -hmm. pots and 40 percent single malt. Very good. Um, the, the Avril also asks about is the liquid distilled from, from scratch in Walsh's distillery? So I know you mentioned there about your long term contract with Irish distillers, but maybe for those who are, who are new to Irish whiskey, do you want to explain exactly like how that contract distilling works? Yes, I suppose, um, you know, that's, a, a, I suppose, a permanent agreement with Bernard and Irish distillers uh, for Bernard to source his own liquid there and obviously to his own specification. And um, Bernard, I suppose we did have our own distillery in County Carlow called the Royal Oak. Uh, but um, I suppose we went into partnership with the Italians a few years back and in 2019, Bernard um, and the Italians, we fully demerged and Bernard obviously kept his brand, which he built from the start, which is the Irishman and Writer's Tears. And I suppose, look, at it's like every separation or every divorce. Look, at somebody has to walk away with something or nothing, you know, but I suppose we're very lucky. Um, you know, Bernard, obviously, the Writer's Tears and the Irishman is very, I suppose, true to his heart. And that's, I suppose, the main thing, you know. Mm. Um, there's more questions coming in there, but I wonder it might be a good time because I know that my glass is empty <laughs> and I'm worried that a yeah. few people at home might be. If you want to come on to the double oak and then we can come back to those questions. Um, yep, certainly. So I suppose we have our next one, which is the double oak. And um, the double oak, I suppose, came about in 2019. And this was a collaboration uh, Bernard had with the Lagarde family in France and the Allery Cooperage in France. And I um, I suppose our, we did produce a limited edition Doe XO cognac cask um, previous to that. And with its popularity, um, Bernard decided to make the double oak a cognac cask, a permanent skew within the range. Um, so he laid down 12 casks initially, but obviously laid down extra cast to make this a permanent skew within the range. So this is aged and matured in two woods. So you have your American bourbon and also your cognac cast finish for 12 months there as well. It's 46 ABV, non-chill filtered. Um, so it's a little bit more robust, I, I find anyway, like, you know. Mm. No, it's got, it's got an extraordinary nose. Uh, we've already got David in there saying it smells more like pot than, than barley. Um, and Johnny says, that's so buttery, smooth caramel. Yes. Yeah, it's incredibly uh, easy on the palate. Mm. You get that wonderful, again, you'll be, you get your initial possible base, but you get your lovely figs. If anyone's getting figs or apricots or tannas, really dried, dried notes, dried fruits. It's really tannic, like really, yeah. really tannic when you have a when you have a taste. Um, a lot, lot of kind of cinnamony as well. It's not not as um, not as green fruit kind of as 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 the first one. Um, exactly. Uh, hmm. And what ABV is this? It is a forty six percent. 
Mm. And is that so? That's higher than the the the, the copper pot, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, a few more comments in there. Say, so Gregory says, uh, if I said it had a good body, would you hold it against me? <laughs> would it hold it against <laughs> me? <laughs> um, it is. It is full bodied. I have to say, it's just. It really do, you really do get that 46 ABV there, more so than the copper pot. Obviously, the copper pot's at 40%. So you are getting a little bit of higher ABV on the palate, but you are getting the, the French cognac cast. You are getting the different cast expression coming through there, which is really adding wonderful complexities of flavors, you know? Mm. Um, and the Brian there says, could you explain, mention again what the two casks are? Um, and I suppose you could try that in with Bob's, which is, is it also a 60-40 pot still malt? Are they both the same blend? It, it is similar, yes. The only difference is be your casks would be uh, different. Obviously, you're introducing the cognac finish there. Uh, but the two woods is um, American bourbon from Kentucky and French oak. Which is the which has the cognac in it then? So yeah, that, that correct. That yes, makes perfect sense. Um, and I'm just conscious that maybe this is my fault. We should have come to this, but why we're still drinking the first one. But um, there was a couple of mentions. Yeah, David mentioned Speyside up above. So just in case there's anyone um, on the chat um, who who isn't familiar, we've we've talked about copper pot or sorry pot still and and single malt. Um, what 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 for for those who are new to Irish whiskey? How would you describe a pot still? Because there also is a question there about the blend of the pot, of, of the barley to unmalted barley in the pot still. What what ratio? But yeah. I the ratio is the same as what Irish distillers use. So if you want to kind of explain what, what that means in terms of unmalted barley and rob and malted barley and, and, yeah. uh, and what a pot still is. Yep. Yeah. Well, I suppose we are, you have your pot still uh, mix and your pot still has to be at least 30% malt and 30% unmalted barley. And basically, I suppose, going into, the, I suppose, a little bit of history with our lovely neighbours across the pond adding in the taxes on malted barley back in 1785 and that's when I suppose it all started to revive itself and and obviously the Irish don't like paying taxes so we've added the unmalted barley in with the the malted barley to dodge the taxes if you like you know and unmalted barley has more rawness to it so you get that look more robust flavors and that little bit more harder more um spicy notes whereas your malted barley has more sugary, so it's a little bit more sweeter. And it's um, it's when I suppose the enzymes has waken up the sugars, so you're getting that little bit more sweet vanilla. And then your unmalted barley is more your raw material. It's raw, you know, unmalted barley. Hmm. And obviously it's famous for its spiciness and its oiliness. So that's yeah. the kind of character yeah. that we're getting from the first two, as you mentioned, the pots of spice with, with the first one. Um, yeah. We have some Tanya and Breen in the chat says, buttery, honey, cinnamon, uh, strong caramel, much stronger than the copper, copper pot. Tasting is definitely cinnamon, buttery, um, another quality malt, definitely a buy for us. And speaking of buy, I think it's 57, 57 euros is what we sell at Ford Celtic. Um, and you can maybe get a discount when Dublin Airport reopens um, off lane of there. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and John uh, says the initial aroma tells higher uh, ABV, very nice. Um, and sorry, that, that tasting out with the strong caramel, much stronger than copper pot, was from Douglas and Al, um, who are posting under the name Mary, just not to get confused. <laughs> um, marvelous. So, so when you, you were talking about the, the first whiskey being, I suppose, you know, age, age between 25 and, and, and 45 uh, women and, and men and, and that kind of thing, do you have a yeah. different demographic when you move up through the double oak or, or is the range all in that, in that area or...? Um, I, I suppose when people has, I suppose, introduced themselves to the range, you know, essentially the copper pot being the, the first one within the range of 40 percent. So people has tried it and I suppose they're looking for something different. They're like, OK, we want to explore the range more. And that's what Rider's Tears is, a, is all about. It's about creativity. It's about, you know, ca different cast experimentation. It's about knowing what the next level is to try within the range. Um, and I think that's a great uh, tribute from Bernard, um, you know, sourcing different casts, you know, playing around with different ideas and different casts and getting the best of taste profiles. And, you know, so there is kind of no right or wrong within the range. And it's great to start in your copper pot and work your way up then to the range. You know, mm. there's something for everybody, regardless, 25 up to 45 or 
45 onwards, there's, you know, something there for everyone. Mm. We did we didn't a comment in there on it in terms of did the it's stronger than the cotton pot, certainly. Did the double oak get top ten in USA? I heard it did. It did indeed, yes. It won uh the top it came in the top ten at the Whiskey Advocates Awards in 2019. And bear in mind it was only released uh four months previous to that. So uh yeah, we actually came number uh, seven, if I'm correct. Well, that's not bad. Top so 10. Oh, a really a really good start for um the double oak. Mm. If I was top ten whiskey zoomers, I'd be delighted, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. Um <laughs> Johnny says he put a drop of water in and got orange off it. Um, so I'm, I'm actually going to try that myself now. But while while we're uh, while I'm doing that, does do we have um, a, a place where you source the cognac from? Is it is it a relationship or or? Yes, we uh, it was a relationship Bernard formed with the Lagar family, um, uh, from France and from the Allure Cooperage in France. So um, Bernard began sourcing his cast from them. And uh, again, we introduced the, the double oak as a permanent skew within the range. So that's where we source. And Bernard would only source the finest casts. So all casts are grade A casts. Mm. Um, excellent. And is that is that is there specific? I know the next two we're going to come on to are, are also obviously cask finishes. Um, is it is it all different relationships that he's tapping into? Or is there a, a single third party? Or is there is there a secret at all to it? I suppose with Bernard, there's a, uh, the next one is, uh, I suppose, let me in a little story that we're going on to the Marsala cast and uh, Bernard very much so has a very sweet tooth. He loves everything sweet. So uh, going on to the next one, we have the Marsala. So this is um, a 45 percent ABV. It's again, you have your same typical mash bill. Um, malt and pot still, um, age matured in a bourbon and finished for 12 months in um, a Marsalic cask. And they were sourced from the Florio winery region in Sicily. So again, Bernard on his travels, sourcing his casks and um, building up amazing relationships with uh, these guys. And uh, he also has a very sweet tooth. So it works hand in hand. Um, and so for, for those who might, not, who, who might not know, um, <clears throat> what, is a, what is Marsala? Marsala is a fortified wine cask. Mm. Uh, so again, you get that wonderful sweetness, um, very easy drink. And Marsala, I find, for me, I find it a little bit more drier on the complexities of flavours, uh, more dried figs, apricots. But again, it's super, super smooth. And the, the, the Marsala that's used in this, is it, is it a, because obviously we're big fans of Marsala down in Clarny. We've, we've, mm. we've got two on the menu, uh, a dry and sweet. Mm. Is this more on the sweet side or the dry side or? Um, I find it on the sweeter side, but it, it can be a little bit, for me, I find it a little bit more drier, but it it, it is sweet in general. Mm. Well, I suppose that makes, you did say he's a sweet too, so it makes sense that it would be a sweet Marsala. Yeah. So stupid question for me, my apologies. <laughs> That's, but um, Bernard is very much parcel to anything sweet, so he he loves working with these kind of casts, you know. Mm. And this is bottled at forty five percent ABV. And when did you you when you mentioned the double oak came out? Um, I suppose was it two thousand eighteen? Did you say it was late two thousand eighteen? Uh, two thousand and nineteen. Mm. And this was this was two thousand nineteen as well, is it or? Uh, this was the Marsala was slightly before that. And there was uh, a, there was a cognac okay. cask. Was there a cognac cask on top of the double oak as well? Was there? Yes, this is how the the permanent skew um, I suppose joined the the range because the Doe XO was a limited release. The Doe XO cognac cask was a limited release, and um, this was proven very very popular. And, you know, people were asking Bernard, you know, can we bring out more? Can you bring out more? So um, that's when Bernard decided, you know, I need to get more casts. I need to um, make the double oak a permanent skew within the range, you know, with the cognac finish. And um, people really just love it. It's just such a great expression, you know. Mm -hmm. No, certainly. Um, 
So yeah, I mean, this is this is really interesting. Lots of kind of like golden syrupy notes. It is quite yeah. organic on the on the palette as well. Um, and you do get your pasta initially, but you get that wonderful sweetness coming through there. Martin says tiramisu, um, and Marcel is certainly there. Uh, Johnny says yeah. like, um, sweet toffee apple taste. Um, David says he found I, copper, copper, copper pot dryer. Um, so that's an interesting one. Um, Tanya mm -hmm. and Breen said definitely got Marsala influence, Moscatel, dried golden sultans uh, on the nose, golden syrup on the nose, almost a dessert wine. That's a... That's a, fabulous, yeah. That's spot yeah. on, yeah. Mm, yeah. I agree in there with almost a dessert wine again. So that's excellent. Great, great feedback on that one there. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, there's a question in, in David uh, says... Is there a reason for using bourbon casks from the USA? What's the reason behind that? Um, I suppose that's, I suppose, what Bernard's choice is, you know. Um, I suppose that's just, I suppose, his choice of what he chose to pick for the cast, you know. Um, initially, they are finished in, some of them are finished in bourbon, and then they might be finished off in something else. So um, I suppose, again, that's Bernard's mastermind behind the, the cask choice. You know, yeah, and obviously bourbon would be would be the 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 cask of choice for Irish whiskey. Um, yeah, do you know? Do you want to explain to those who are new to, to Irish whiskey on there why why we use so much bourbon? Or, um, I suppose I suppose primarily, I suppose that's where we source our casks. Really, you know. Hmm. Um. Yeah, and obviously because because vanilla in 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 um. In America, obviously, they 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 can only the, the specifications for bourbon mean that you can only use the barrels once. So it means that they're a knockdown rate on the market. So they're cheaper than the expensive wine casks, which which never hurts, especially when you're a businessman like Bernard is. Um, yes. I um, there's some great more taste notes coming in there. Tanya and and Brino ask, what's the retail at? And I believe we're at seventy six or around there, or seventy nine fifty. We have it in in at Celtic Whiskey. Um, and again, I might get it at a, a discount at the airport, but Celtic Whiskey is the place to shop with. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. That's not bad at all, though, for for, um, for 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 what it is, for for the for the for the quality of single cask it is, the the the, the way Irish whiskey has gone these days in terms of uh, price, and as you mentioned, the champagne blend, it's it's not a bad uh, not a bad price point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, all, I mean, all our whiskies are very well within uh, price point range. Um, definitely there's i mean there's a whiskey to suit every palate and i think price point and um, we're not overpriced for premium whiskey that you are getting you know two different cast experiments or and cast finishes so i think our prices are very well priced in general mm. um yeah no definitely definitely i think that's definitely a, a massive attraction to the brand i mean it's very hard to find value in in irish whiskey these days it's something that comes up a lot on on these chats um so it's always good when 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 you do find it I mean, especially when you're yeah. on the right of stairs of 45 euros, when you think of the, the the blends that are on the market in in the kind of 20s and 30s range, 45 euros for that kind of quality, easy drinking is, is not bad at all. And then once you're out there, it's easy to move slightly up the range, I suppose, you know. Um, exactly. And, and that's it. I suppose anyone that wants that's more into their more experienced uh, drinking who wants to go up slightly higher in the ABV and they want to maybe try different casts, you know, and and that's what Rider Steers is all about. It's, I suppose, dare to be creative and it's more, it's more edgy. It's more kind of, you know, quirky, if you like, you know. Mm. No, definitely. Um, Anton says, uh, does where you source the casks make it make such a difference? Yeah, well, every different cat, different casts have different taste profile, like, you know, so um, from your cognac, you will get your different flavors from your cognac, cognac cast as you would from your Marsala from, from Sicily. So cast from all around the world has different complexities of flavors. Mm. And Bernard says, really nice. What's the maturity on the double oak and Marsala? How long are they in out from the bourbon and in, in those other woods for? On whole, they're about nine to 10 years. Um, they will initially do their age and maturing in bourbon and they'll finish off for 12 months in the in this particular one in the Marsala cast. Mm, brilliant. Um, and Douglas analysis, sweet, sweetish and dry on the palate. Reminds me of the famous Undy Arms outside Aberdeen sticky toffee pudding. So there you go. <laughs> That's the yeah, I mean, it's great. Mm. 
it's great to hear everyone's different tastes. And as I said, tasting is very subjective. So what I might get, somebody else mightn't get. And so it's great to kind of hear different quotes and different expression tastes, you know. Mm. No, 100 percent. That's what I was literally about to say. I was saying to say that it's, it, that's exactly what you were saying at the very start when we when we kicked off about subjectivity, that it reminds them of the, the under arms outside Aberdeen. And, and yeah, no, it's, it's that personal touch. I think whiskey is probably maybe even more emotive or most emotive of all the kind of flavors you get in there. Um, Brian says great legs in, in the glass on the Marsala. There, there are tears, Brian, you know. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, before we move on, is there anything you want to add on to that, that one, Lana, or is there any more questions coming in from the chat? Um, that looks good for me out there. Marvellous. Yeah, perfect. Um, so do you want to talk to us about the, the, the Mizanara cask? Yeah, um, this is an expression that um, came to life in 2019. Um, and I suppose it was introduced just in time for the Rugby World Cup in Japan. Um, and that's where our casts are sourced from. And I suppose with every Mizanara wood, there's a quite, it's quite costly. So one barrel would be 16 times more expensive than a bourbon cask. That's how expensive uh, Mizanara wood is. Um, it's also quite porous. So it's quite hard, quite difficult to work with um, Mizanara wood. Um, so we have initially two casks were produced um, in September 2019 in a region of maybe 1300 bottles in total that was the initial release um, and it's, it's single cast at 55 percent excellent um let's get stuck in it's really uh, it, I, and i've just seen david uh, mention at the same time it really popped out of you onto the nose like it's got a it's it's fresh. What 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 did you say the ABV was again? Sorry, it's a fifty five percent ABV. You definitely, you definitely get that on the nose. Yeah, and it's matured in American um, bourbon barrels and finished for nine months in Mizanara oak barrels. Well, that's that's so different than what we've had. So it's extremely different. Yeah. It's very much, um, you get that wonderful oriental spice, lovely sandalwood. Mm. You, really, you really do get mouth-watering flavors from this one. It's incredible. No, it really is. And, and Patrick in the chat there says, getting licorice on the nose. Gregory says, excellent conversation from the nose to the mouth. Uh, doesn't try yeah. too hard. Um, yeah. No, definitely sandalwood is, is the is the is the one. I mean, it's it's it, it really pops yeah. up, but it's there's a lot more. There's something else there that I, I I'm getting. I can't quite um, articulate, <laughs> but it's definitely it's 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 so complex and it's it's so much darker actually. I'm not sure if people notice in the glass yeah. than, than the ones we've had. Um, yeah, it's, and it's my light isn't great, but it's definitely darker. Mm. <clears throat> David says a uh, real toffee for me. Some nutmeg maybe. Um, Francis treacle and spice on the nose. Martin says, great spice. Smells like a well-tuned uh, cello. <laughs> I'll, I don't know what that smells like, but but I, it sounds interesting. Um, subtle yeah. magic hands says, Josh, you definitely have that, that almondy note coming through. And I wonder how much of that is coming from the from the Mizanara and how much of that is coming from the, the underlying whiskey that we, we started with. Um, yes, it's, it's very well fun. complex all the same, you know, and I think for, for the Mizanara wood, there's a, such a lovely, vibrant, lingering finish to this one. Like it's, it's like it's layered. It's, it's very much layered and um, you get that wonderful, your pots of spices. Then you get that wonderful um, Japanese Mizanara wood coming through there, which are extra layer of, of intensity of spices. And then you get your higher ABV coming through there, 50%. It's very forgiven, but the, the finish is just so long. There's great intensity of, of, of uh, finish in this one. It's really, it's phenomenal. It's, it's really so good. Mm. No, it definitely is. And you said that, that, that Mizanara is 16 times more expensive than the bourbon cask. Why, why is that? Yeah. And um, the wood itself is more rare um, in Japan. Um, I suppose their, their forests are quite limited, so they're, they're not... Um, wood wouldn't be very highly sourced, like in, in large capacity, you know? 
um, and then it's very difficult to work with. And um, the, the wood itself is quite porous. And um, so quite costly and difficult to work with, you know. Mm. And is, is there any truth to the to the story that it, it, it's also because it, the, the trees don't grow straight? Is that true? So it's, it's harder to cut the staves from? Um, I haven't heard that now myself, but maybe so. I mean, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not claiming to, to know something. I'm just saying that, that I've heard once upon a time, but I'm not sure. You hear so much in these whiskey tastings that you don't know what's going uh, Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Real. Um, but I heard that that because it, it, it's the only wood, wood in, or oak in the world that grows towards the sun, which means that it, it, it doesn't cut straight, which means you, you have more waste when you're cutting it down to, to cut the staves. Uh, although John says, look, too much sake for you, which is probably true. I'm, 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 like I said, I'm not claiming this is a fact. I'm just saying you pick up <laughs> information in whiskey tastings and you, you, it, it could be totally wrong. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, Josh Smith says, Japanese oak also grows very gnarled, so yield is much lower. Um, so maybe that's more what, what I was trying to describe and, and ter terrible to articulate. Tanya and Breen says, very complex, almost paradoxical flavors, licorice, candy notes, high bank, orchard syrup spice on the finish um all very true uh and yeah. is a non-expert for a non-expert is there an ideal percentage for a starter uh you said this is 55 percent what you recommend a, yeah. a new whiskey drinker to drink at um i suppose look at i'm in the airport every day and i suppose we have all newbies coming in looking for a whiskey i suppose they're introducing their palate to a whiskey and i i would always say look at start with our classic copper pot and work your way up to the range because I would like to give somebody a whiskey at 55% and just kind of, you know, destroy them from the beginning, like, you know, and I'm thinking, Jesus, I'm not into this, like, you know. Um, I suppose, I personally, I would always start anybody at 40%, you know, because you want them to enjoy the whiskey. You want them to take in the, the characteristics profile from the ABV, from the cast, from the start, from the finish, um, and you just want them to enjoy it like and then when they're experienced enough with that whiskey you then introduce something else you know like saying you look at you've tried this maybe you could reach up to the marsala cast you know it's sweet and um, that's basically how i would kind of judge it you know mm. no no i think that's that sounds like a like, like very good logic i mean we have um like big thing that big buzzword in, in, in Irish whiskey at the moment is the kind of the castor and crusade and it comes up on these tastings yeah people wanting yeah. Castor whiskey but um people are always saying why don't they do more castor and whiskey but when we're doing whiskey classes down in in, in Clarny people often find 40 percent is is a high alcohol for them you know compared to their wine or their beer they find it too strong yeah. so you know it is about finding that balance and what your palate is is used to um exactly Exactly. And I think within within our range, there's something for everybody. And I think that's very important that Bernard has created um, Writer's Tears portfolio that there is an expression for everybody. Whereas, you know, somebody likes more sweeter palette. We have our Marsala cast. And then obviously for the cast strength crusaders, we have our our pungent 55 percent Mizanara wood. So there, there's something for everybody within the range. Mm -hmm. No, definitely. And, 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 and as Brian touched on a good point there saying taste buds could be warmed up by now, uh, which is which is true that we've started at the 40 percent copper pot and now we're here at the 55 percent Mizanara at the end of the tasting. So I'm, I presume that's mm. by design as well. And speaking, I suppose, come back to cast strength and um, watch Whiskey World were the first um, people to introduce um, the Irishman cast strength in 2008. So um, we have been, you know, innovation really much from the start of the brand, you know. That's a, that's a, that's a really interesting one because I, 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 Irishman Castron is a, is, a, is a curveball into the mix because we were having a conversation on here the other night where Redbreast were claiming that their cast strength was the first one, but their one came out in 2012. So if the Irishman came out in, in 2008, then that would definitely be first. And we've got an old yeah. bottle of Connemara that's a cast strength in the bar. Um, and we don't, yeah. we're not sure of the year on it. So, um, you know, we'll see. <laughs> but actually, Irishman cast strength in 2008, that's, that's brilliant. That would be a new one. I must yeah. remember one for future tastings. Yes, we were the first one of, of any brand in, in, in Irish whiskey uh, within 50 years of producing the first uh, um, cast strength in 2008. So, yeah, very proud of that, you know. Um, Gregory says, I love the whiskey fitness aspect. Build your whiskey muscles. Um, and Owen D says, you're missing the best of them all here, the redhead. Yes. 
Uh, yeah, we don't have the redhead on tonight, but um, I suppose the redhead is uh, like the long lost cousin within the range, you know. It's mm -hmm. the only single malt we have uh, within the writer's, ra writer's Tears range. Um, it's at 46% ABV. It's matured entirely in Oloroso sherry cask. So 100% uh, malt to barley as well. So yeah, it, it's um, a very good good one if you're looking for a nice single malt within the writer's uh, tiers range. Mm. No, excellent. And that, that answers John's question in the chat, which, which asks uh, your opinion on that. But I suppose what you mentioned at the start that the Irishman range from Walsh was more the, the malt focused than the relatives more the pot focused. Well, why the redhead in, in the mix? What, what, that's a bit of a curveball in that regard. Yeah, I suppose. I suppose that's really one for Bernard. I suppose it's just throwing in a, a long lost cousin there within the range just to have a single malt, I suppose, within the within the range of writer's tears, you know. Or the Irish, the Irishman family disowned the redhead look, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, brilliant. Martin says there's a place for each of these in my cabinet. So that that's excellent. Um, Anton says, is there a, a mortal, is it, is it a, a mortal to, to drink whiskey with Guinness? And if not, should it be drank before or after a night out on the lash? Or lass, he says, but I presume he means lash. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what you want to make of that question, but. <laughs> I suppose, look at each their own, I say, you know. Yeah. Well, Josh says it should be mandatory and, I, and, and Gregory says both. So I totally agree. I think you have, you have your beer and your chaser. Um, my, yeah. my advice is always to st start with something like the Rider Stairs Cup Pot, move your way up through the through the range as your as yeah. the, the drink gets on, and then finish on a smoky whiskey. After ten pints of Guinness, I like a good peated whiskey. So you'll have to deviate from the range then, but that's <laughs> that's for when yeah. the bars reopen. Absolutely. Um, you were mentioning at the start, uh, we've we twice come back to the, the kind of start of it with Bernard, and you mentioned that the Hot Irishman. Um, do you want to tell us a bit more about that product and and um, its story within the within the, the brand? Yes, uh, certainly, Luke. Um, I suppose back um, in the 90s, as I said, when Bernard was working in the UK, he was uh, in IT and his good wife, Rosemary, um, she was uh, within the hospitality trade and uh, within the Swiss Alps. And at that time, I suppose she was making about on average 20 to 30 hot Irish whiskies uh in demand uh at the resort and um they come up with the idea of uh you know how, how can they make this one product that they could have everything in the one bottle you know and within the range the first product that resulted in the hot irish man so basically it's colombian coffee beans with um your founders reserve and this makes on average about 18 to 20 hot Irish coffees. So it's cutting out having the bottle of Irish whiskey, everything, you know, uh, the coffee, the jar of coffee, it's basically everything in the one bottle. And this was their first product, uh, was the hot Irish man. Um, so it's, it's, I suppose, one of the first products, which was a big, huge success. And it really started from there, really. And how does it, how does it work? I've actually, I've actually sold a lot of these, but I've never actually made one. I mean, obviously, it doesn't float the cream for you, and um, you're going to have to heat it up, do you? Or, or genuinely, I mean, I've I've no idea. Um, I know how to make. Yeah, well, I, I suppose you, you just put your water. measure in. You just put your measure in and add your boiling water and cream to top, um, because you have your coffee and your whiskey in one, so you don't need the hassle of, uh, you know, your jar of coffee or your bottle of whiskey. It's all in the one bottle, so you're just adding boiling water. Yeah, your own measurement is your own specification of how strong you want to make it or how much influence you want of the hot Irish man, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and then obviously cream to top and that's it. Marvellous. And, and this was the first product in the in the Walsh range, was it? It is indeed. Yeah. The cause of it all, as my as my grandmother would say. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gregory says hot, hot Irishman. Thanks for the shout out. So we'll have to take your word for it. <laughs> Although actually I, yeah. I see you there, Gregory, actually, now that you said it, I couldn't see you on screen, but there you go. He's, he enjoyed that one. <laughs> uh, Tanya and Breen says, I remember trying um, at a trade event for Odbin's way back in the day and being delightedly surprised. Um, it's an excellent Irish coffee. 
Um, and the vendor gave me a tip for shaking up the cream in a plastic bottle and pouring it off the back of a, a spoon onto the surface. Genius. No, they're just definitely always shake the cream, Tanya. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Ma Marty's iPhone says the copper pot is beautiful for an everyday drinker. Love it. But OK, had the Marsala recently and it was lovely. The Mizanara is on another level uh, and live the cast strength or, or, or love the cast strength. And there was another question further back about the price we sell is for, for 90 euros for the Mizanara, which when you consider the, the, the cost and the expense of the oak and the fact that it's a higher ABV, which means there's more juicy in that on it, um, is, is, uh, is a really good value, I think. Um, uh, Josh Smith says, thank Christ the gyms are opening soon. So <laughs> um, I'm not sure, <laughs> I'm not sure I don't get the context of that, but um, Shane says, any new expressions planned for this year? There is, um, Bernard has, has, is working on one as we speak. Um, a very exciting one actually to join uh, the Writer's Tears family. This will be a limited release. Um, obviously, we can't say too much at the moment, but there is definitely something coming this year out. And Bernard, as I said, is working. Uh, it's a work in progress at the moment. Um, and it's very interesting. And yeah, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it myself. Um, so yes, there is. Oh, exciting. And on that vein, yeah. what's, the, what's the future of the, of the brand? Obviously, you touched on the, the relationship with, with the Royal Oak before, but um, where, where are, you, are you just going to keep carrying on in the same vein? Is there, um, are you going to maybe source whiskey from somewhere other than Irish distillers or what's the plan? Have you any secrets? Um, at the moment, I suppose, look, at, there's always innovation and Bernard is always exploring and creating wonderful expression so with bernard you just never know so watch the space you know mm, no excellent um adam dunn says four to four for this tasting not a weak link in the bunch so well done um uh avril says is the mizanara cask available outside duty free it's available from celtic whiskey um so you can get outside of duty free and the wonderful thing about the pandemic um you know there's, there's not a lot of silver linings but the few of the silver linings linings is that a lot of duty free exclusives are now finding their ways out of airports because airports aren't as busy so um, I don't know yes. why we have the Miz an hour. Maybe it's not, but it, but it's definitely a benefit in, in general. Yes. Um, initially, the two casts, we have two casts initially for the loop duty free and um, it branched into the domestic market. So um, Bernard has sourced a few more casts for um, the domestic. So uh, I suppose just giving everybody a chance to sample it, if you like, you know. Mm. No, de definitely. Um, yeah, I suppose that's you've given us a, a, a fantastic run through of the range. Then, is there anything you want to tell us about Riders Tears before you finish and, and maybe give someone time to get in any last minute questions in into the chat there? Yeah, well, well, I suppose like I hope everybody enjoyed it and it was great. I suppose, you know, tasting all the great expressions we had and you know uh, any questions are welcome. Mm. Brilliant. Um, we got one in there straight away. Um, about hi, could you tell us? From which distillery you take casks, which Kentucky distillery, and which Marsala producer? Um, the Marsala cask is from the Florio winery region, to my knowledge. And then the bourbon casks are sourced from Kentucky. Again, I don't have the exact um, details of them, but obviously Bernard will be, uh, I can get them, source them from Bernard. Oh, interesting. Um, and I don't know, we'll see. Or... John says, uh, pole Luke. That's a, that's a good point, actually. A pole. What, what's the, we all, I'm, I'm, I'm totally off my game tonight. I don't know, I don't know what it is. Um, but a, a, a pole. So John obviously thinks four, three, one, and two. Um, do we, I'd love to hear everyone else's thoughts. Uh, what, what do you think yourself, uh, Lana? Do you have a, a preference in, in terms of how you like them? Yeah, I really do have to say I love the Japanese cast for me. Um, it has so much character. There's so much robust to it. It has full body for me. Um, definitely the Japanese cast for me. And then my choice for number two would be the double oak. Definitely. Hmm. Oh, interesting. And um, outside of the, the cup, what I imagine is your biggest seller. But when you're you're in, in you know, pre-COVID and, and, and flying with the sales, what's your what's the next one that kind of tends to fly to people that people tend to go for in general? Um, I suppose in the airport is a mix. You know, we have 
I suppose the Rider Tears Copper Pot is so popular on a whole, like, you know, everyone knows the Copper Pot. And I suppose you're constantly introducing um, people to broaden their palette within the range. Um, very much so airline staff just love the Copper Pot. Um, all our Canadian ladies, they go mad for the Copper Pot. Um, and now that they have, they're more familiar with it, they're nudging up towards the double oak which is finishing the cognac cast and uh, so again again they're working their way up to the brand so which is fantastic and um i suppose for the as you said for the cast trend crusaders will always go for um you know the japanese wood you know mm -hmm. and um outside of ireland what would be your your biggest market um our biggest market i suppose would be the u.s Mm -hmm. And is there is there like you know a lot of uh, of, of, of Irish whiskey brands have a, a new emerging market they're focusing on, be it be it Taiwan or Scandinavia or Eastern Europe? Is have you got a particular kind of brand strategy in that regard? Or um, we are, I suppose, branching into Asia as well. So um, we are making our way across. So um, it's a, obviously an ongoing work in progress. Um, so we are in fifty different countries worldwide. So. Mm. Brilliant. Um, let's let's look at these poll results. So, so um, with the first one, John's was was four three one two. Uh, Niall says four two three one. David four two one three. Patrick four one three two. Uh, Tanya and Breen three four two one. Uh, David says Mizanara top. Jackie says four two four one three. Johnny says four three two one. Arrow four three two one. Justin says four 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 four. <laughs> <laughs> Emily, 2431, uh, Liam, 4231, Davey, 4123, Fergus, 4321, Fran, 4312. So I think, I think looking at that, just doing a rough without properly calculating, it looks to me like it's, it's Mizanara, Double Oak, Marsala, Copper Pot, but, but I don't know if you feel free to disagree with me there. Um, yeah, I, I agree completely there. Yeah, absolutely fantastic, fantastic result. Yeah. Marvellous. And it's funny how the, the last, I've always said this a few times before when I'm doing tastings, that I'd love to do one where I know that the best whiskey, or my objectively, I think the best whiskey in the range is, and stick it in the middle and see how it fares, because people always are really interested by the first one, and the last one, you're half cut, so it tastes great anyway. So it always tends up, ends up finishing high in the tasting, you know? Um, so it'd be good to know outside of that. Martin says, uh, I met Bernard at Whiskey Live in 2019 and his passion for what he does was so evident. Well done to him and the team. Thanks. Thanks, Lena. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, no, that's Mar Martin, uh, Marty's iPhone says, is there more Cognac XO cast coming or, or is it done? I suppose that, that is the double oak you're saying? Yeah, the double oak is now a permanent skew within the range. Um, so, um, yeah. And it's effectively the, the Kanye cask XO made permanent, is it? Yeah. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Avril says, any plans for a sherry finish? And John answers her by saying, check out the redhead. Yes. Yes. <laughs> what about a, What about a sherry finish with the with the pot still malt blend? What's what is there any chance of that coming coming down the line? Or um, I'm not too sure on that one, um, but you never know. Hmm. Um. Marvellous. Uh, Shane says, looking forward to an Irishman tasting. Um, Ed says, Ed comes in there with, with another one. Um, no, marvellous. That, that's, that's, that's fantastic. So great feedback there. Lots of, lots of wonderful. Um, it's great to see everyone at the end popping on with their, with their poll. Um, thank you so much. Well, one more question there. So Patrick says, any chance of a PX cask finish or anything interesting like that on the line, do you know? Um, there could be. Who knows? Um, you just never know what Bernard. <laughs> <laughs> that sounded like a yes to me. <laughs> well, I'm, again, I'd have to consult with Bernard on that one. <laughs> Marvellous. Well, listen, Anna, thank you so much for, for your time tonight. I really hope um, everyone enjoyed the tasting and, and it's, it's, it's really great. So um, as we say, a few comments tasting, it's uh, a, a lovely, a politician's yes, says Gregory, in a lovely evening, say Tanya Green. <laughs> So thank you so much. Um, it's been, oh, it's thank been you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Hmm. No, no, thank you. And, and for anyone who's either watching back this and recording and, and wants to ask a question or didn't get their question answered or, or didn't get a chance to ask it, just drop me an email and, and uh, I'll forward it on and make sure we, we, we get it all answered, as, as I always say. So thank you so much, everyone, 
who joined and I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thank, thanks again, Anna. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.